I have known John Turk for a number of years. I think we met first when he came to speak to the uh, uh, a, a symposium many years ago about kayaking uh, through Tierra del Fuego to Cape Horn. Uh, my jaw dropped. Uh, I subsequently learned that he lived in Fernie, British Columbia, uh, where Joan and I had a ski condominium. And so we had a couple of opportunities to get together there. Uh, I think it was probably on one of those occasions, maybe after a glass of wine or so, that he told me that he planned to kayak from northern Japan up the uh, east coast of Russia and across the Aleutians to uh, North America. My jaw dropped again. <laughs> Uh, he has not been idle since. Uh, he's whiled away a little time by cir circumnavigating Ellesmere Island, uh, which I think you would agree is also jaw-dropping. So tonight he is, I think, going to cause uh, the sound of many jaws to drop, and I'm looking forward to hearing about his latest adventures. John. We got sound, yeah. Oh, good. I, I, I woke from a deep afternoon nap. You, you know the kind. When you open your eyes, you go, where am I? Uh, who am I? Uh, what day of the week is it? Whose bed am I sleeping in? And then I looked up and I saw the ceiling fan going whoomp a whoomp a whoomp a swaying on a frayed wire like it was about to fall off and land on my head. Yeah, 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 I remember now. I got it, I got it, I got it. I'm in Haniara, capital of the Solomon Islands, in the tropical South Pacific. I'm naked. I'm slimy with sweat, I'm stuck to the sheets in dried blood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got the whole situation now, okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, hey, um, everybody here has a brain, yeah? Everybody's got a brain, yeah? Well, you know, let me just tell you a secret just between me and you, okay? Brains can be handy things sometimes. You know, when you have to take your driver's license exam or do your taxes. But brains can be a downright pain in the neck on a hot day in Haniara. You see, because brains are trained to think. You see, and at that time, thinking is a disadvantage because your brain often, you know, goes on these woe is me rants, you know. Woe is me. What am I doing? I'm 60 years old. I'm in pretty sorry digs. I'm beat up again. I could be, you know, like one of those guys on the poster hanging out with his wife, you know, uh, drinking Mai Tais on the beach, you know. W you, you know, where have I gone wrong, you know? <sighs> you know, any guru worth her website will tell you this is really dangerous ground, okay? So, yeah, I mean, basically my brain was saying, you, you know, what are you doing here? How did you get here? And, and it's like, you know, you have a little child that picks up a, a butcher knife and you can't take it, you can't take the butcher knife away from the child you have to trade it for a teddy bear. So when your brain is on a rant like this, you have to simplify the thing, you see. Why am I here? Well, I'm here because the crocodile didn't eat me, okay? So that's where we're going to start our story today, okay? <laughs> right, all right. So um, I was doing a solo sea kayak trip in the Solomon Islands. Um, little sit on top. I know, I know everybody will tell me that sit on tops are mere toys for that day at the Club Med that you didn't go to. 
but they're the most fundamental, most minimalist craft. And the idea was to be out of sight of land in the big rolling waves of the, um, the trade winds of the South Pacific, in that big power all alone in the smallest boat, as I said, out of sight of land. Oh yeah, I've got another secret for you people, yeah. Yeah, you know, if you're off the coast of Vancouver Island or something and you get a little storm or a crosswind and you get uh, washed off course, it's a problem, but not that big a problem because it's pretty hard to miss North America, right? <laughs> but when you're out in the South Pacific and you get washed off course and you're trying to hit an island two kilometers in diameter, then you see you can have big trouble. So I was out there, I had underestimated this piece of ocean, you know, I, again, the, all the posters in the airport of the Mai Tais and whatnot, and I had not given this piece of ocean the credit for which it deserved. And I was getting beat up, washed off course, and fighting for my life on several occasions to get back upwind to the island that I was headed for. So. I had a dangerous crossing now. It was like, okay, John, settle down, you know, get with it. Okay, let's take this seriously. So I have an uninhabited island and then a long crossing. So I figured, okay, I'm going to stop. What could be cooler than this? I'm alone. I'm going to stop at an uninhabited island, coconut palms and whatnot, and I'm going to sit here for a day or two. I'm going to rest and I'm going to watch the currents and the tides and, and figure this thing out so that I'll make the crossing at exactly the right point in the weather and tide situation. So I'm in a real good mood. I'm paddling in. I'm going to be alone. I'm going to go snorkeling. And did, you, did you see that? See, I'm all alone, you know, and I can't ask anybody what's going on, and it's like, I saw a flash of motion out, out of the corner of my eye. What was it, you know? Am I dreaming? Is that, what's going on here? So I go to shore, and I'm walking on, and look, and I look, really fresh crocodile tracks. Man, this is the tracks of a 15-foot man-eating crocodile. This is really cool. So I went back and got my camera, and I'm taking pictures, and then, you know, I started thinking about maybe where was the crocodile, okay? Oh, yeah, so the crocodile had worked its, seen me coming in, worked its way up the beach, and it turned around and was coming back really slowly. And I, I had the impression, you know, you're not supposed to anthropomorphize the intentions of animals, but I thought that this crocodile wanted to eat me, you see. <laughs> so I got on my boat, and I took off, and I hit the crossing at exactly the wrong point of the tide and I got all beat up, but I didn't die. Okay. W where am I going with this story? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You see, I remember now. You see, remember, I'm back in this hotel room in uh, Haniari, you know, and after I decided that I was here because the crocodile didn't eat me, my mind was still on a rant, so I went back to, you know, review my childhood, you know, how did you get here? So I grew up in a very loving, suburban Connecticut family. I went to a fancy prep school with George W. Bush. You know, we were the ruling class. You know, we were off to make something of ourselves. I went to an Ivy League school, and I was ready to become a contributing member of society. Oh. You see, and then I discovered fast motorcycles and sex drugs and rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. So I became, I ended up becoming a long distance sea kayaker, expedition sea kayaker. As Bill said, uh, this is off of Cape Horn. Uh, this is the Pacific Ocean uh, right out here. There's the Cape Horn itself, not this point, the next one, that's the Antarctic Ocean, that's the uh, Atlantic Ocean over there. 
So I, I got into doing these long trips. It was way much more fun than uh, what I had been trained at Ivy League school to do. And as I developed this um, habit or avocation or addiction, whatever you want to call it, I decided I wanted to take a production sea kayak and cross the North Pacific Ocean. I thought that'd be a cool trip. And actually, you know, you can't sail, a, you can't paddle a production kayak ride straight across the ocean, you're gonna die. So I went up following the rim of the, uh, the North Pacific Rim. It's actually a very doable trip, although it has not been repeated. Um, <laughs> it, it took us two years. Uh, so anyway, here we are off the coast of Kamchatka. Kamchatka is the home to the largest concentration of active volcanoes and grizzly bears on the planet. There's no geological, scientific, biological connection, but the two together uh, make it a really wild place. And um, you know, I'm a skier also, so I had to come back and ski that line. It's a beautiful line. It was a special trip. I couldn't go by it and not ski it. That has nothing to do with this slideshow, control, X, delete. Um, so we're up here in the North Bering Sea, and we're getting beat up by winds and slugs of ice coming out of the Arctic Ocean and so on and so forth. So we were late. What does late mean in this context? Well, it was our second year. We thought we'd do it in one year. And now, uh, if you take too long, the ocean's going to freeze up again. So we're paddling along, and we see a village, a small remote village. There's no roads up there. These villages are very isolated. And we thought, hey, this is cool. We'll stop at the village and you know, have dinner and whatnot. But we're late. We got to keep going. So um, forget it. We're not going to stop. Uh, we'll just get the afternoon. We'll get another couple miles down the road. And then. All of a sudden, the wind started to blow. No indication of my barometer watch. No lenticular skies, uh, clouds in the sky. This incredible storm, and the rain starts to fall. And the wind picks the water up and blows it into the rain. And the wind picks the rain up and blows it into the water. And you can't tell where the air ends and the water begins, or the water ends and the air begins. It's all crazy, you see. So we decided to go to town after all. <laughs> so we come in through the surf. And this woman, Lydia, walks up, you see. She walks down the beach. And I, you know, I'm kind of old. I'm getting out of my kayak. I'm a little creaky. And she speaks in English. And she says, John. Misha, it's good to see you. We were expecting you. The grandmother created the storm to bring you to our village. She wants to talk to you. OK, look. I'm a chemist. I grew up in suburban Connecticut. I went to high school with George W. Bush, you know. Th this doesn't compute, you see. But at the same time, there's a storm out there. There's bread baking in the oven in there. I can smell the bread, you know. I'm not in a position to be cynical. <laughs> I say, great. We'd love to see the grandmother. See, and the next day we go up river and we see the grandmother. And the grandmother grasps me by the elbow and grabs Misha by the shoulder and says, Misha, John, come back. It will be good if you do.
So we spent the next, the better part of the next five years, we finished that expedition and we, Misha and I dropped everything and, and focused our life for the next five years around this village and this old woman, Mulanot, and Kutcha the Raven. And I wrote a book about this called The Raven's Gift, A Scientist, a Shaman, and Their Remarkable Journey Through the Siberian Wilderness. But I'm not talking about that tonight. So I'm on the road, you see, and I'm doing my dog and pony show, and I'm living out of my pickup, and I'm living in the concrete jungle, and I, I'm going along and signing books and stuff, and every once in a while, somebody comes up to me and says, this book is about shamans, right? And I kind of shudder, you know, because they've got this... Uh, angry demeanor about them. And I said, yeah, it's about shamans. You got a problem with that? And they go, yeah, you know, I don't believe in shamans. So I'm not going to buy the book. So I go, okay. You see, but I want to get the point across that this isn't about believing in something. This is deeper than that. So I decided to write another book and take the shaman out of the picture. And I'm going to come to the same place. Okay, we... So let's start with something. I'm a scientist after all, okay? Let's start with fact that we can all believe in because it's absolute fact. Okay? I want you to imagine going out into the tropical forest, we're back in the Solomon Islands now, with a stone axe. And I want you to imagine cutting down a two meter in diameter tropical hardwood tree and making a canoe. Now I've changed scales here because there are no canoes left made in the old way of that size. And I want you to imagine sailing that canoe across thousands of miles of open ocean from Tahiti to Hawaii. You see, nobody could do that today. No community of people could do that today. But that's in our genes. That's in our DNA. That's the power that we have. You see? And I wanted to tap into that power and try to understand it a little bit because I think it's not important but essential to moving humanity on into the 21st century with some semblance of, of peace and love and compassion and sustainability. So, okay, now, you know, I've gone through my whole life. I'm 65 now. I decided to do a very difficult trip, a trip that Jerry Kablenko had put up on his website as one of the last undone feats of Arctic adventure, of Arctic endurance that, that nobody has attempted, nobody has completed, which is the circumnavigation of Ellesmere Island, 1,500 miles, 100 days, 15 miles a day, half a marathon a day, across some of the roughest terrain on Earth, carrying your own gear and food and all that stuff. And just for a scale, this is the Arctic Circle. This is Ellesmere, well, way closer to the North Pole than the Arctic Circle. So long story short, I ended up traveling with a young uh, river kayaker, extreme boater, Eric Boomer, John Turk, Eric Boomer, John Turk, Eric Boomer, John Turk. That was the expedition, right? So we set out in May, and the ocean was frozen. This is ocean, that's land, okay? Uh, we knew that. This is no, like, big secret. Um, we didn't have enough time to complete the journey in open water, so we decided to drag our boats across the, uh, the ice for a couple months to get a head start on things. 
So, you know, it's cold like here, 20 below, and the wind is blowing, and then the sun comes out, and, and look, almost no ski penetration. We've got a nice crust. It's, it's a beautiful traveling in the most glorious environment on the earth and putting down the miles. Now we're getting close to 80 degrees north latitude. I'm watching my um, GPS, and we're going to have a little party at 80 degrees. That's uh, and it's a white man's line, of course, but the line between the high Arctic and the polar zone will break out an extra Snickers bar and, we, you know, we'll party down. So we're going along and I'm watching my GPS and like we just got a little bit farther to go and we're just about there. We're going to camp right on the line. And this guy is already there. <laughs> now, I'm not making this up. He was within meters of the 80.000. He's right there, you see? Okay. And he stayed there. And we made camp, and we camped together. And we, we showed up around 4 in the afternoon, and he was there the next morning and had breakfast. Well, we didn't feed him, but he was there for breakfast and um, just hanging out. And it, never more than 5 meters from us. Okay, this is a real wolf, right? Okay. Now, what is going on? What's the communication between me and the wolf? You see, now after spending five years with the Koryak people in Siberia, I'm absolutely certain. There is absolutely no question to me that that wolf came to talk to us. See, now, this isn't some recordable conversation. This is a non-recordable conversation, so you have to trust me about what we were talking about. <laughs> okay, w was this the fairy godmother wolf promising us safe passage across the polar zone? No. Don't be ridiculous. There is no fairy godmother wolf. This is a real wolf, you see. And what this wolf was saying is, you guys are crossing into the polar zone. You're going to get tired. You're going to get hungry. You're going to get frostbitten. You're going to get strung out. You might die up here. Welcome. It's good to see you. <laughs> and this is the first lesson that wilderness teaches us. You're vulnerable. You're going to get tired. You're going to get hungry. You're going to get strung out. You might, you're going to die. Welcome. It's good to see you. You see, and accepting our vulnerability, accepting the power that's greater than we are is the first step to compassion and happiness and sustainability and all that. What white men try to do, you know, myself included, if you feel vulnerable, you buy a bulldozer, you know, and you try to crush over your vulnerability. And if you're still vulnerable, you buy a bigger bulldozer. You see, but it doesn't work. It's not going to work. It isn't working. So we have to listen to the wolf. Okay, so, um, yeah, you look here, nice uh, solid ice, uh, snow on the ice, yeah, and then it starts to warm up, uh, and the s snow melts, and it turns into water, and now this is still the ocean. We're not walking on the ocean. We're walking on the ice under the water on the ocean. That's land over there. Now it gets harder to make your 15 miles a day because one you're a knee deep in water, and it's harder to walk on water than on good firm snow. And then your feet get wet, you see. And you cut holes in your shoes so when you do get up onto dry snow, the water will run out faster. Uh, but you, you start to break down. Your body is starting to break down. You're working harder for your miles. Your feet are starting to rot, and so on and so forth. And then you get up on the north coast, 
and there are these pressure ridges, 10 meter high pressure ridges, and you're dragging your boats over and lowering them down. Yeah! And this is the quintessential sore toe picture, and why do I label it ecstasy? Am I pulling your leg? Am I making this up? Uh-uh. No. I use as an analogy, I was, you know, I live in Montana in the summertime, and uh, last summer I, I took a hike up on the high ridge above my house. It was a July day, and, it, you know, it's, it's right behind my house. I know this place really well, and I, you know, didn't dress very warmly. It was a beautiful sunny day, and you get up on the high ridge, and all of a sudden a summer snowstorm comes in and it's blowing, and it's snowing, and it's grappling, and the wind is blowing, and are you miserable? No. This is exactly where you want to be. This is the vulnerability that the white wolf talked about. This is ecstasy. And this is the journey that we're on. This is what the old woman asked me to come and find. So now the, the ice is starting to break up, and now it's becoming downright dangerous. This, you, this is too dense to paddle in, and you start walking around on this, and it's tricky, you see, because uh, these ice flows are small, and this is all in motion, ladies and gentlemen. This is what it looks like. This is what you're trying to travel through. So how do you get through this? Yeah, right, let's think. What did you learn in kindergarten, right? <laughs> See, white men, myself included, have a lot of really ridiculous concepts. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Yeah, I'm going to get tougher than the Arctic Ocean. I'm going to get tougher than the Nari Strait, you know. I'm going to get tougher than the ice. Well, it doesn't work like that. So what, did, what was the grandmother going to tell me? How has she helped me get through this ice? And then I remembered something that another old woman, a Koryak woman in Siberia told me, that you have to find flow, the space beyond willpower. You see, if you think this is really hard and I'm going to get tough, and I'm going to get through it. You're not tough enough. So it's not going to work. You have to somehow remove the barrier so the barrier no longer exists, so you don't have to be tough, so that you get through it, so that you flow through it. As Marina said, if you lose the magic in your life, you lose your power. She didn't say if you lose the keys to your bulldozer, you lose your power. <laughs> you know, I read the paper the other day. I don't want to get political, but I am political. You know, it's getting crazy out there. And there's darkness. We're going to talk about that. Darkness isn't going to help us. It's not the answer. It's the magic. If you lose the magic in your life, you lose your power. Here's what we've been talking about. Willpower, vulnerability, ecstasy, it's magic. It's finding the magic. And that's what wilderness te teaches you. There's other ways to learn it, but that's, that's the, the, the total message that I'm asking you people to take home today. So we finished that trip, and I'm an old man. You know, I'm 65, and all kinds of bad things happened to me at the end, and uh, I was ready to quit. And then I, I get a letter from Malu Bean, an email from Malu Bean. Now, Malu Bean grew up just like me, you see. He was a privileged person. He grew up uh, 
as an educated person in his society, and, and then he got a good job, and then he dropped out. But he lived in communist China, you see. And he lived through the Great Famine, where 50 million people starved to death, where people ate other people. He, ate, he went through the Cultural Revolution, where his father was tortured for being Muslim, right? He became a Red Guard, you see. He, he, he wrote uh, propaganda slogans for Chairman Mao, death to America, down with imperialism, you see. He wrote that kind of stuff. And then when Chairman Mao went out of power, he became an advertising executive. It's the same thing, you see. <laughs> So he wrote me an email. He said, let's uh, ride across the Tibetan plateau on our bicycles and take a journey to the Dalai Lama's birthplace. And I came out of retirement. And uh, my wife and I, and we, we decided we're going to go do this. We're going to find the Dalai Lama's birthplace. So we start on the northern end of the Himalayas, and we climb up into the Himalayas, into the old Tibetan culture. Now, I'm going to stop for just a second. Let's think about after World War II. World War II, horrible, horrible thing. 50 to 75 million people killed. And then after the war, the world tries to rebuild its sanity, right? And they try to base it on industrialization. But Tibet said, wait a minute, maybe we can rebuild the world based on the Buddhist concepts of peace and compassion and love and agricultural return to the land and, and basic um, non-consumption. Maybe we as a country can give you an example of another way to do it, you see? Well, you see, the Chinese didn't like that. And they brought in trucks and tanks and darkness and said, you can't build a society based on magic. That's what Donald Trump is doing today. He's saying you can't build a society based on magic and love and compassion. That's the darkness, you see. And now the Chinese, I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm sounding, but I am sounding like I'm sounding, right? That's just the way it is. Now, that was in the 1950s that they uh, made the uh, military conquest of Tibet. Now they're conquering Tibet with concrete. They're building freeways. They're building industrialization where nobody wants it. Look how many cars are on these roads. None. Zero, you see. They're just building freeways to conquer the Tibetan people with concrete, you see. They're, they're, they're going to crush it in one way or another. So we ride for a long time, and then finally we get out of the freeways and up onto the passes, and, and now it's um, starting to turn into winter, you see. Yeah, did I tell you, did I forget this, did I tell you we're on the um, search for the Dalai Lama's birthplace? Right, right. Well, you see, Malu Bean, he had no idea where the Dalai Lama's birthplace is. He just used that as a ruse to get us to go bike riding with him, you know. We were totally lost. But you're on a Buddhist mission to find something, and you don't find it. You see, you can't get grumpy. That's one of the rules. <laughs> so, so we ended up going around this holy mountain, but by this time we were going the wrong way around the holy mountain, and all the pilgrims were telling us this is really bad because we're going to unravel our prayers. So we were dealing with that. Okay. I'm joking around a little bit. During the months just prior to this trip and while we're on the trip and the months just after, a hundred people Tibetans poured gasoline over themselves and set themselves on fire because they basically have very little avenue to express their ideas. And they wanted to express the idea that this is not okay.
to conquer these principles and to crush the magic. This is not okay. We're asking the world to listen, please. There is another way. So we reached the high pass and um, we came back into town and met this journalist, and he said, I hear you guys have been riding around the mountains for a couple months looking for the Dalai Lama's birthplace. Well, you passed it on the second day, you see. <laughs> and this journalist guy, this guy, he took us up to her. There's the Dalai Lama's birthplace, and there's his niece. She wasn't that happy to see us. You know, Outsiders have caused a lot of problems. She really didn't want to deal with us. Now I'm going to, just about at the end here, I'm going to read two short passages from The Crocodiles and Ice, my book, which is incidentally for sale at the end of this talk. I hate to say that a particular landscape or structure holds religious or spiritual significance because then some true believer will start a war to attack or defend it. So I refuse to think that I had visited a specific place. Instead, it was more about a feeling. In a sense, nothing significant happened. We finally reached our goal goal and received a frightened human reception, not a blessing or a mantra. Yet, I still had a deep internal feeling that the house was a symbol of refuge in the madness. Humans herding sheep in the cold fog, snowy mountains, hand stacked sheaves of barley and sun-baked bricks. Sustenance, peace, and compassion rising out of the land, sustainable and full of hope. And that's where I was going to end the story, but you see, I thought about being on the, you know, out there in the con concrete jungle doing my dog and pony show, and I thought about people are going to come up, and why are they going to tell me they don't want to buy this book, you see? What are they going to complain about this time? And I thought, well, you know, people are going to say, well, I don't want to go around Ellesmere Island, and I don't want to get cold and wet and miserable, so what does this have to do with me? And I ended up working as a storyteller with a modern dance company. We put the Raven's Gift to dance, and we went around the country, Boston and New York and San Francisco, and we were dancing the message of the Raven's Gift, you see. And, um, yeah, even I got to dance. And we ended up, um, long story short, we ended up going to this prison where they had these young people, 14 to 18 years old, in prison in Gledwin Springs, Colorado. And the warden or the, the teacher or the master, or whatever it is, of the prison said, we want you to talk to these kids for an hour, turn their lives around. You know, they were beaten child criminals. They, they had all, you know, been substance abusers. Many of them had been violent. It was a beautiful spring day. They were in jail. So he said, let's talk about healing. Let's talk about getting better. Let's find it, talk about finding an emotional way out of here. And we started dancing, the dance of healing. And at the end of that hour, every one of those child criminals, every one of those beaten teenagers was up and dancing with us. We had the whole prison dancing. And at the end of The Crocodiles and Ice, I write, and I think it's safe to paraphrase what the Dalai Lama is so patiently and assiduously telling us. 
that if we free our minds of all the extraneous input and confusion, the random useless stories we invent for no good reason, we might be lucky enough so the empty space fills with ecstasy. And then ecstasy will morph seamlessly into compassion for ourselves, our neighbors, and our environment. That one word, compassion, stands out loud and strong in all of the Dalai Lama's writings and teachings as the consciousness revolution that will be the beginning of healing. Is it really that simple? Or maybe I should ask, why are we making it so difficult and complicated? Thank you. Thank you.